how old is the baby Yod? Well, we know. <laughs> We know that, but how old is it biologically speaking? I'm talking about the development of something like a Yod, or at least Yod's species. So in The Mandalorian, I'm, don't worry, there's no uh, spoilers here because I've not seen the show and I'll never see it, but uh, in The Mandalorian, there is a tiny Yoda, uh, or at least a tiny little baby of the Yoda species, and affectionately known as Baby Yoda, even if it's not Yoda. Anyway. What's interesting is that this baby Yod is, relatively speaking, at least compared to us, quite old, and yet it retains some of its more uh, baby-like features. So let's put this in some kind of biological context. What are the oldest organisms that we know of? Well, first of all, Yoda, in the original trilogy, lives to about 900 years old. You are not so good. You will look her, something like that. So like uh, a couple... Yeah, uh, almost almost a millennia old, so very, very old. What are the oldest animals on Earth? <laughs> Organisms on Earth. Well, there was a mouse named Yoda, the oldest mouse known uh, to science, and it lived to the ripe old age of four. It's the oldest mouse. And so there are incredibly long-lived organisms, organisms that can live for thousands of years, but none of them look like a baby yod. They are more simple organisms like uh, fungi and plants and corals and sponges. Nothing that could possibly be filled with uh, mitochondria, which are the powerhouse of the cell and or midichlorians. That's it. That's the word I was thinking of. So in terms of more advanced organisms, more complex life, what is the oldest that we know of? Well, right now there's a maximized theorized Yes. Lifespan for the Greenland shark, which is around 512 years. That would be the, the longest living vertebrate, assuming that tiny Yod here has a spine. So a Yoda or a Yoda species could then live a lot longer than any known vertebrate creature that we know of, and it would make it the longest living organism. But why does it retain its baby-like features for so long? Well, we can graph this kind of thing, as, as I often like to do. And if you graph this kind of thing, let's say we have the development of a creature here, the, uh, the development from you know, birth to death of a, uh, and its features, and you know, whether it's an adult or a juvenile or a baby. We have this on one axis, and then the other axis we have time. This uh, line here, this 45 degree angle line, would indicate a normal development, let's say. So what is a baby -ode? he said. Well, if we were to graph this out, the baby Yoda seems to not have as, well, at least relatively speaking to organisms that we know of, it seems like it's holding on to its baby-like features for a long time. So it's not going through as much development as time progresses. This would be, this would push it into a group, uh, into a classification we call Neoteny, N-E-O, uh, starting with N-E-O, neoteny, so like new. And neoteny is the retention of juvenile-like features into uh, reproductive adulthood or further along into the lifespan organ of the organism. There are many organisms that you know of that are like this. Um, probably the one you know the most is the axolotl, or the Mexican cave salamander, which retains its juvenile gills and other features well into adulthood. So it could be the case that baby yod is... Uh, is in a neonatal state, that's it's retaining its features over time, or it could just be that a baby yod holds. On, it just takes a long, long time for a yoda species to develop the traits because it lives for almost a millennia. So this baby yod could also <laughs> could also fall along this normal line here. Of course, there are also other ways to progress as an organism um, through time. Chronologically speaking, you could have uh, rapid development very quickly uh, progressing through time so you can advance through your life stages very quickly and you can also push past some of these stages to uh, increase your lifespan and to further develop in ways that we haven't yet categorized uh, with science and this also progresses here. So there are many ways for an organism to advance itself along its lifespan but for my money I think uh, baby yod here is either uh, somewhat neotenous, it's retaining juvenile features, or it is just has an extended lifespan and we just do not know how quickly it develops. That would be, for me, the biology of a baby Yoda.
or whatever it is. Hello and welcome to another edition of Because Science Live, the live show, see, of, <laughs> of this channel where I take all of your comments, questions, and corrections and I try to answer them or be at least be entertaining off the top of my head oh, and try to say something interesting. Let's see how that goes. Look, I'm not a working scientist. I'm not, a, I don't have a PhD or anything, but I know a little bit about a lot of sciencey and pop culture things. So if you have a question for me that you think I might be able to answer, put it in the YouTube chat and I might get to it. Make sure it's a good question. Please do not spam the chat or else I will never answer your question. But if it's a good question, Voice of the Void Nate might get to it and then we might get to it. What's up? What's up, Kyle? I don't know. My mouth hurts. That's a cool baby Yoda. Never been cooler. Baby Yoda's so hot right now. So, for, uh, for, first question is from Matterbeam. MB, OG. What good argument would you give an author, author or artist for making the effort to feature more science in their work instead of going with what's easy or su superficially cool? Hmm. Well, uh, so we just, we just did an episode on The Expanse on the channel. I encourage you to go back and watch that. And... Um, I, I guess I guess what you're asking is why would you want an author or someone who's doing world building to lean more accurate rather than less accurate? And um, you know, I'm kind of on the fence about this because there's a lot of great storytelling you can do uh, without being a hundred percent accurate. And I think that's totally fine. If you're telling a great story, I mean, just relatively speaking, most of the great stories aren't, 100% scientifically accurate, right? I mean, most of the great novels, most of the great movies, they're not 100% accurate about everything that they're saying scientifically. So I think you, that's still perfectly valid. I think there are advantages though, which you're getting at Matter Beam, in that a great hard science fiction story can really encourage and inspire people in a way um, that's eventually fruitful. Like you will see this uh, with Star Trek all the time. They're not the most accurate, but they're accurate about some things. And if you go into a place like JPL or NASA, which I have, and you talk to people, they all, almost all of them say, I watched Star Trek as a kid, and then I became an engineer, I became a rocket scientist or, or what have you. I got my PhD in physics. So I think the advantage in leaning towards accuracy where you can, where it makes sense for your story, is that you might end up encouraging more science fiction, more great stories, and more people uh, going into fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. And that, if you want to consider that one of your benefits, one of the possible benefits of your story, I think that is laudable. I think that is a, that's a very noble pursuit if you want to do it, and if you have the expertise to do it, I think, I think that's a great reason why. You can ex inspire a future generation of nerds. Because why not? What's next? From Nightcrawler114. Ooh, selling those stories of crashes to news media. Why do I have to uncross my legs when I'm having my blood pressure taken or when I'm donating blood? It's always puzzled me. Huh. I don't know. Me being a naive person, I would assume because you, when crossing your legs, you can block the flow of major veins and arteries uh, in your legs, or at least hamper that flow, and you want your blood to flow normally when it's being taken, or when you're going under, or when um, you're going through some operation, because if blood isn't flowing properly, especially in your legs, clots can form, those clots can then dislodge themselves and make their way to your heart and then kill you. Um, Blood flow and uh, interruption of blood flow, especially in large limbs like your legs, is really dangerous if it's interrupted. So I'm guessing they're just being safe and saying don't have anything impeding your blood flow as we are messing with your blood or um, your circulation or blood pressure or that kind of thing. Um, that would be my naive guess. There might be a more complicated setup, but if you are blocking you know, a major artery or a major vein. Um, I'm guessing that would alter blood flow in some way and then it might mess up the reading or it might mess you up depending on what you're doing. That would be my naive guess because it seems really simple that you're just pressing on a vein and halting the flow like a pipe, you know, uh, constricting it. But, uh, but I don't know for sure. If you know for sure, put it in the chat. But that would be my guess. From Sam Average Man. Oh, How Sam Sam the Average Man. How does salt lower the freezing point of water? I don't know. 
I don't know. I know that it does. I know that the reason why you would put something um, like NaCl, like table salt, uh, you know, sodium chloride, I know why you put it on snow. Um, well, I mean, there's a grit factor there, but, uh, but more importantly, it makes it so it needs to be colder for snow to free, to, for water to freeze to make snow. So at whatever temperature it is, it's now hotter and above the melting point, and then so the, the ice and the snow melts. I know that it does do that. I do not know chemically why it does that. I'm assuming it's the mixture of the sodium and the cal uh, the sodium and the chlorine chloride chlorides um, with the water and the H2O that um, probably forms a solution that has a lower melting point. Um, I mean, a lower freezing point, but I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know specifically. Sometimes it's okay to say you don't know, even if it makes you look like you're not as knowledgeable on the internet forever. From Traspia, from one super villain to another. What? Wait, what? Sorry, from one non super villain to okay, another. Okay, see, so that's what is. I thought you said. I was. Yeah. <laughs> I had no idea what I you're misread. talking about. Okay, yeah, thank you. If ethics were not an issue. Okay. <laughs> what, <laughs> what experiment uh -oh. would you like to see performed? I don't. I shouldn't answer this. Uh, uh, I think uh, ethics are very important. Ethics are what separate us from um, brutality and savagery, what, what gives us empathy towards other people, what brings us together as a society, what, what forms the basis of bills of rights and how we should treat other people. We need ethics. In fact, it makes us the species that we are. Being able to have theories of mind about other primates such as we and to put ourselves in their shoes, feel what they feel and not want to be treated the way that they want to be treated or vice versa or whatever, golden rule kind of stuff. So we need ethics. So I'm not going to answer this question I, like that. I, I will say that there are a number of experiments you could run that would be very informative that we can't do now. You, you, you say, for example, you could take two children, two babies, or you know, a hundred babies, uh, one is a control and another hundred babies, and then like start them smoking at 10 and then track them their entire lives. You know, you, there, there are things you could do under extremely controlled conditions where you could get right at the variables. See, the problem with experiments, especially public health experiments and uh, um, experiments, of, yeah, experiments about our health a lot of the time is that we cannot force people to become a part of a certain experimental group or not. We have to find people who are making these choices about how to live their lives naturally, and there's a lot of confounding factors. So if you could control everything about a person's life, you could exactly get down on some of these variables that we're curious about, rather than doing hundreds of studies trying to get an answer, we could force it. But then again, then we'd become kind of monstrous, I think. You saw what happened in Bioshock. That wasn't good. From Zebel Zebel. A slave chooses a ma- oh, by the way, never mind. Yep. What's your favorite formula? Would you kindly- what? What's your favorite formula? Um, would you kindly ask me that again? Dang! It's almost like mind control isn't a thing. Um, my favorite formula- I don't know, I, I've answered this before. I really like- I really like the kinetic energy uh, formula because it's- Pretty simple. You can derive it with a with a couple of extra steps from uh, Newton's second law, and uh, it describes a lot of stuff that I consider in these nerdy analyses uh, when you're trying to find you know impact force and energy and velocity and all that kind of stuff. So I like the kinetic energy formula uh, quite a bit. You know what I. I, I recommend people try this at least once if you have some kind of mathematical bent to you um, that. Try to derive an equation yourself if you know basic mathematics. If you try to like work from you know Newton's second law to kinetic energy and then you get there without too much help, it is incredibly empowering. I remember that um, I got to uh, the space-time interval, how you, how you can uh, differentiate between coordinates in space-time. 
uh, by myself after a lot of help, and that felt like I was the smartest person in the world, which I'm not. But I, doing the equations yourself and knowing how they are formed and why they are the way they are is much more important than just memorizing the formula. Um, and this is what I was taught a lot in college, is that the numbers don't really matter. If you know the variables and how they go together and what they mean, and why they are together the way they are, that's much more powerful, because then you can plug any number into in, in any configuration and get some kind of answer. So I would say dig into any equation that interests you and see if you can get at it yourself as if you were the first scientist to do so. It's very... Uh, Sometimes tedious, but it's also rewarding. I don't spend hours at home doing that sometimes for fun. I don't. It's usually for work, for you. From behind the eyes. You know what's behind your eyes? The thinnest bones in your body. The best place. To... Never mind. What Magic the Gathering card effect would you make your superpower? Cascade, baby! Cascade is incredibly powerful, so when you cast a Magic the Gathering card with Cascade on it, you reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a card that costs less, and you cast that for free. So I would want to cascade into every situation. Everything that I would do would have a knock-on effect to some other thing. It would have a, a ripple effect, like I would become my own Chaos Theory. And then my name would be Chaos Man. And my power would be that you can never see what's coming. See? You didn't know I was just going to stop there. Chaos Man! Let's do our last question. From Lucas Gross. Ew. Yeah. <laughs> what is your favorite? <laughs> like you haven't heard that before, Lucas. I apologize. What is your favorite real world power source, theoretical or otherwise, and your favorite fictional power source? Huh. Well, I, I really like the arc reactor as a fictional power source because it comes from a place that's not that crazy to think about, where you find a new atom, like, you know, your super smart dad shows you, <laughs> like, the structure of a new atom, and you form a source of energy from that, and you put it into a smaller thing. Well, I mean, I like the arc reactor because it gets at the two things that we're trying to optimize when it comes to power, and that size, physical size of the thing, you know, it's hard to put a nuclear reactor into stuff because they have to be kind of big at the moment and just energy density, how much power you can get out of it. So for those two reasons, it's kind of like the optimal fictional power source. Um, so I like that uh, in terms of a real power source, um, I, like, I like natural sources of energy. If you've, ever, if, you, if you've never seen like hydrothermal, like, no, not hydrogen, like uh, hydroelectric dams turning their huge turbines, those are th those turbines are incredibly precisely engineered and they're massive and it's just raw it's just kinetic energy turning into pot uh, potential energy turning into kinetic energy turning into rotational energy and it's just a, it's just such a raw animalistic thing i like that you know like nuclear power and such is and stuff is really cool but it's hard to kind of wrap your head around i like like i like a big dam and you can quote me on that Thank you so much for watching this edition of Because Science Live. Woo! We had a week. I've been seeing a lot of this little dude online, and I'm not sick of it. Next week, uh, I know we haven't been uh, here live for a while. That's, you know, holidays and stuff. But next week, we have new episode, another live, and another footnotes where I will read all of your comments and questions. It's going to be a fun one. Uh, I hope, because I didn't see you last time, I, I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. If you celebrate, I hope you have a great weekend. Stay safe, stay nerdy, and uh, be nice to each other because this, and this little guy, all we have it is. <laughs>